All right, well, today's last talk in the session is by Mikhail Ferov from Newcastle also, and his talk is about conjugacy death function, death function for lamplighter groups. Over to you, Mikhail. Hi, thanks for the introduction, James. Uh, all right, so I'll try to explain what this means and perhaps why is it interesting. Um, Unlike rest of the Newcastle crowd, I will not be talking about totally disconnected locally compact groups. Well, I mean, in some sense, yes, because I'll be talking about discrete groups, which are trivially TDLC, but I mean, I will not really be talking about them in any int topologically interesting way. So everything I say is a joint work with Mark Pengitor from Ohio State. So it's a bit of motivation. So why, what is, what is this all about? So the idea is that you might want to try to understand an infinite object by approximating it homomorphically by finite objects. I mean, if you've ever seen me give a talk, usually you should remember that I'm that guy that keeps rambling about the residual properties of groups. And this will not be different. I'll just be talking about slightly diff different aspects of it. So the idea is that if I have an infinite countable group, I might want to see how much information can I get about the group just by inspecting the finite quotients. So a group is residually finite if I can just distinguish individual elements of my group by looking at finite quotients, meaning that if I have, you know, two elements that are different, I can find a finite quotient or can find can be a bit of an overstatement. I know that there exists one that such that these two elements have a different images in that finite quotient. And then, you know, one could use this to produce an algorithm to solve word problem. I definitely do not recommend trying to run that. However, it is one of the motivations why one, why one might want to be interested in such a, in properties of this type. I usually, or to a large extent, study conjugacy separability. What does that mean? That means that you know, a group is conjugacy separable if whenever you are given two elements of your group that are not conjugate, you guaranteed that there exists a finite quotient of your group such that the images are again not conjugate. So you could say that you, know, you, that you can distinguish conjugacy classes by looking at finite quotients, or if you want to be a bit more fancy, you can say that conjugacy classes are, are closed in the profinite topology. And again, using this, you could describe an algorithm that might, that can solve a conjugacy problem. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an algorithm that just enumerates all finite quotients of your group. So it's not really something that you want to run. However, you could ask like, okay, well, can I quantify this in some sense? Because you know, when I'm given an algorithm, the natural question is like, how bad is it? How long does it have to run? Or how much space will it use? And so algorithms of this type, you could ask, well, if I have to enumerate finite quotients, how big do these quotients have to be before I can call it a day? And so first let's just say like, how do we measure our input? So will be the standard thing, you know, just the word length, meaning that you know, if I have some generating set and I'm given an element, so I just ask like, what's the shortest word that I can, like what, what is the shortest word that I can uh, use to describe such element? And then, you know, I can look at, balls of certain radius. So it's just elements that can be described by words up to certain length. So then we can define a depth function. So that function just quantifies residual finiteness. That's saying that, yeah, when you look at it, this is a bit of a mouthful. 
you know, this whole definition, but it's not that complicated. It just tells you that if you look at all words of length up to N, what is the size of a quotient such that you're guaranteed that elements in there will not die in that quotient? And similarly, you can quantify conjugacy separability where you just, you know, you ask, okay, I, I'm given two elements that are of certain length, of length up to N. And I can ask, what is the size? What is the size that I'm guaranteed that there exists a quotient that distinguishes these two, uh, the conjugacy classes of these two? So I would just, you know, if you were, if I told you, okay, there, there are, these are, there are two words and they may or may not uh, represent elements that are conjugate. So if you knew what the conjugacy depth function is that you can just list all, or you can list all finite quotients that are up to the value of this function. Oh, the, you can list all finite quotients that are at most this big. And if there is none that would distinguish the conjugacy, then you know that there cannot be any. So, you know, that just means that, you know, at certain point, if you're doing this business of enumerating finite quotients, at certain point, you can call it a day. So, so that's, the, that's uh, the that's perhaps the motivation uh, for why would why should one care about these uh, functions? Now this is a bit tricky because this the way this is defined it depends on the generating set. But as you might have seen uh, in Alex's talk yesterday, he was talking about growth and that, well these things depend on generating set, but only to certain uh, to some extent so you know again if we define the notion that you know f is dominated by g if they differ up to linear distortion meaning that you know i can just go go a bit further and perhaps multiply that uh, a bit by some constant then you know I say that G dominates F, and if they dominate, if F dominates G and G dominates F, we say that they're equivalent. It, this is a very coarse uh, notion of asymptotic equivalence because th these are free functions that are all equivalent, but you know, in terms of the big O or small O, they're completely different because obviously this grows way faster than this and this guy grows way slower than this. But in terms of this rough uh, asymptotics, we will think that they're the same. And indeed, changing the changing generating sets if we're talking about finite generating sets then does not really make any difference to the asymptotic class so it makes sense just to talk about the depth function and by when you're saying that you just mean the asymptotic class of uh, the asymptotic class or you know up to equivalence of this double e squiggly uh, equation or equal sign so how much is known about these uh, conjugacy depth functions? Not much. So there's an upper bound for virtually a billion groups. Then also in case of virtually nilpotent groups, it is known that it is bounded below and above by a polynomial. And in case of uh, Free groups, oh, non abelian free groups, and fundamental groups of uh, closed compact oriented surfaces of higher genus, 
then it is bound from above by n to the n squared, which already seems like a pretty horrible function or pretty fast growing. So, so this shows that it's a fairly new field of study and you know there's quite a lot of things to be done. So I would like to tell you what we did with uh, regarding lump lighter groups. So just to quick recap on what is a lump lighter group. So it's a brief product or it's a restricted brief product. So what is a restricted brief product? I have two groups, A and B, and this is primarily, I assume that everybody knows what that is, but just to make sure that people are uh, familiar with my notation. So, you know, if I take a brief product of A and B, that means that I take the direct sum of A, B times, and I, the action of B on that is on the left. So, you know, I, I usually understand these as A valued functions from B, which are finitely supported. So, you know, only finitely many, uh, on finitely many coordinates attain a non-trivial value. And then the action is just, you know, realized as a shift. So now the question is like, if I understand the groups A and B, can I actually give some, you know, general answer or general information about the conjugacy depth function of the brief product in terms of depth functions of A and B. And I'm using the word depth functions because you know, I might need to use not just the conjugacy separability, but also residual finiteness or separability of cyclic subgroups. And since I'm saying this, it's probably suggests that the answer is yes, but not, it's not trivial. And yeah, I mean, this is, I do not recommend reading it. It is in a preprint that has been under review for over a year, which can kind of give you the idea of how pleasant it is to read in general. I'm not dissing my own work, but I'm just suggesting and trying to convey the message that it's rather technical and the formulas that you get in the end are not overly pleasant if you do it in a full generality. However, if you just take the lamplighter group, and by lamplighter group, I mean that we have the simple cyclic group, and it's briefed with the infinite cyclic group, then actually the conjugacy depth function is exponential. And that is. Well, I don't know to which extent it is, is it, it is a great result, probably nothing groundbreaking. However, getting the upper bound is not too difficult, I would say, but the lower bounds are quite tricky and I will explain why. So yeah, this is also some corollaries. So actually from this, you can get that, you know, you get, that uh, the conjugacy depth function is exponential whenever you have just some finite abelian group. And just to compare that with the theorem I showed you on the previous slide, if I were to apply that theorem to the lamplighter group directly, the bounds that I would get would be slight grow slightly faster than just two to the n and also it would be only an upper bound so how am i going with time yeah i have five more minutes if i understand this correctly so i'll try to give a vague idea how the proof goes so first you know how to get the upper bound so that I would say is not particularly hard in terms of getting the right idea. It's just sitting down and writing it out. So it's just, you know, you take two elements of the all group and really carefully 
think about how you need to construct the uh, the quotient and what are the key elements in there. So every element is conjugate to something that is minimal. What do I like? Well, I can say what that means. That means that you know, in my I have a my element has a function part and it has an action part. I could say you know. I have this finitely supported action, and then on top of, and then together with that, I have this element that tells me that you know maybe I should move. Uh, and so, I, this element is minimal if the func if the elements of the support of this function are of distinct coset of the slider. That does not mean much, but it just says that you know that the support is the smallest possible it is within the conjugacy class. And then if you have these elements which are minimal, they, they, they you can tell whether they're conjugate just by looking at their values. You know, you don't have to check anything else. All you need to check is whether or not the support of one can be translated onto the, the other, and whether the values actually agree with the translation so you know it's like you know you have a toy train with with blocks on it and all you need to check is like if the train looks the same if you move it around along the track so so yeah so i just start with any two elements and I can assume that they're of length up to n, well, then I can replace them by the minimal conjugates because since I'm saying minimal, you would expect that they're actually shorter. So I'm still staying within the ball. And then all I have to do I <laughs> is to construct a quotient map where I make the quotient on the acting part. And I have to do it carefully, but I don't have to be too careful. It's just that, you know, I have these functions that are defined on infinite set and I take a quotient of that. So you could think that I just, you know, take this infinite line and I wrap it around itself to make a circle. And I'm just saying like, if you make the circle that not too small and when, by I mean, what I mean not too small, approximately N, it's like four times n plus it has to be a multiple of b where b is the slider part of my elements then actually this works just fine and when you think about how big is this group well it is l times p to the n it is l times p to the l and that is roughly the same as two to the n because L is roughly the same as n, and the rest gets uh, gets hidden within the within the rough asymptotics. Now, coming up with the lower bound is way more difficult because you know we cannot just write it out. You have to get an idea. Why? Because how do you how, how do you get in the, this lower bound? You have to find, you know, infinite sequence of elements that are growing in length such that they require large quotients to be able to be distinguished. So you have to come up with, you know, infinite family of, or infinite sequence of pairs of elements such that whenever you take an element, uh, this, this pair and take a quotient that is not big enough and you don't, you don't necessarily know anything about the quotient, you just, you want them to be con conjugate. And that is not easy in general. That's why there are so many, oh, sorry, that, that's why there are so little examples of lower bounds for this. However, in the case of Lamprelite group, we can do that. And that is when we get some help from commutative algebra. So commutative algebra is there for the win. 
And how does that get there? Because the Lampleiter group has an interesting, and it's fairly obvious when you think about it for a bit, but it has a nice algebraic interpretation because you know these functions that you're looking at, you can think of them as Laurent polynomials over a finite field. And then, you know, what is this action by Z? That's just multiplication by the indeterminate X. And the algebraic correspondence does not stop there because if you have a normal subgroup of your Lampleiter group, then taking its intersection with the polynomial parts, and I'm kind of abusing the notation, I'm just identifying doing this identification in my head, then actually this intersection, it is an ideal in this, in the ring of uh, Laurent polynomials. Furthermore, this is a localization of the standard polynomial ring. So it is a PID, or principal ideal domain. And further out, if you actually write down what general conjugacy classes look like, you know, then conjugacy in the Lampleiter group actually corresponds to things being inside cosets of certain ideals. So that suddenly makes things much easier because, you know, you're working over a PID, PID, so you just need to, well, I'm saying just, but you know, it was just throwing things at a wall for quite a while and seeing what stocks. And by saying for a while, I mean for something like three months, but eventually like if you play with this for, for uh, long enough, you can come up with uh, elements that have some funny, the, or you can come up with pairs of uh, polynomials that have some wicked uh, divisibility built into them. So that, you know, it just, you will find out that as soon as you make small quotients, the ideals start collapsing and then the, and then you see that they actually have to be conjugate. So that, that is all there is. Uh, that's all. Uh, I don't really want to go into any details. I'm going over time anyway. I would perhaps say that uh, we actually did uh, this work in a much greater generality, and we're thinking of a higher dimensional Lampleiter groups where the acting bit is actually three abelian group of finite rank, but there are still some kinks that need to be worked out. But you know. In the dimension one, the result holds already. And it's also, uh, also we work in the case where we have the Z3, Z and uh, groups similar to that. But then just the algebra gets way more horrible and I don't really want to talk about it because I feel traumatized. All right, well, thank you, Mikhail, for your, for your nice talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I have mm -hmm. several. So early on, you said things about free groups, and there's only this really big upper bound. So the free group of rank two, nobody can do that calculation exactly. Well, certainly nobody has, well, I cannot say that nobody has tried. I mean, I've tried, but I've I just thought, okay, well, I'll just take the standard proof to show that a free group is conjugacy separable, but then you arrive exactly at this number. As, but, but that's the upper bound and, and... Yeah, that's the upper bound, but the lower bounds, yeah, like, as far as I'm aware, there are none, and I can't quite see why there wouldn't be any, because uh, it's just, you know, yeah, it seems it like be complicated because uh, you have to take you have to go over all two generated finite groups of certain size. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, because if you, you want to consider finite groups of size up to something, and you want to come up with words that will be conjugate in all of them, and that's tricky. Okay. Well, I would have thought the yeah the free group would be my first go to. And what about bomb sex solitaire one in? Ooh. Well, again, I haven't really thought about that. But uh, I mean, the bounce like solitaire groups are quite badly distorted. And again, there's quite a lot I've been sweeping under the rug. But certain distortion plays a big role. You know, how, how are subgroups distorted in there plays a big role on, on how can you make uh, or, on on the asymptotic properties of the of the depth functions and since like you know if you want to make systematic if you systematically want to make uh, quotients of bar bumps like solitaire group you probably want uh, want to do the quotients in the on the infinite uh, cyclic group there and that is not sitting there nicely mm -hmm. So I feel like, uh, yeah, I don't think that even the uh, residual finiteness depth is known for the bumps like solitar groups. I mean, except for the uh, Klein for uh, sorry, ex except for the fundamental group of the Klein bottle and the free abelian group. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a kind of non-specialist question. Oh, yeah, um, sure. So I found the the um, equivalence notion quite interesting for your, for your functions, um, mm -hmm. where you've got 2 to the n, 3 to the n, 4 to the n, um, all equivalent. Are there groups where you can find lots of different generating sets that give you kind of wildly different um, depth functions? I mean, they'll still all be equivalent under this notion, but... So, for example, the lamplighter group, you said that the um, that it's equivalent to 2 to the n. Can you find a generating set where the exact function is, say, normally asymptotic to 3 to the n and 4 to the n and 5 to the n? Um, my guess is yes, but I cannot really think of any straight up. You, you might be able to do just with normal growth, you know, the, the standard growth function, which also has that equivalence. There, there might be some examples in Della Harp or something like that, where you could easily do it for the... Just yeah, for the I mean, I mean the, the size of the quotients remains the same, but you know, you're kind of distorting uh, the word length. So you can, you can probably mess those up quite badly. I mean, when I say quite badly, it still will not be distorted in the proper uh, meaning of the word. But yes, I think like if you, in the case of the lamplighter groups, uh, I think you should be able to get uh, any uh, any exponent you want there. Uh, up to p, probably. You know, you have to fix the p in advance, and then you can get probably any exponent up to p. Because then you know you can you can either just have the one uh, one cyclic ge uh, one generator for your group, or you can just take all elements of your finite group as a part of the generating set, and that will make a lot of difference. Wow, well, cool. Um, any further questions? Then okay, we thank Mikhail again. And that's the end of uh, algebra for today. We will be back tomorrow.